Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Meeting House Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today. My name is George Dornbach, and I'm the Children and Families Associate here at Meeting House Church. We've got a lot of fun things going on in our department, especially every Sunday. Uh, we'll have God's Garden, our Sunday experience for kids nursery age through fifth grade. And every other Wednesday, we'll be doing a tour de parcs through the Southwest Metro. So a new park each Wednesday. Feel free to bring a picnic, uh, bring some friends, or just yourself. We'll be there. Uh, and then we'll also be doing a half-day summer camp here at Meeting House Church, which will happen at the end of August, and registration is open for that as well right now. When the fall starts again, we'll continue our weekly Wednesday night programming featuring voices from within our community. There's lots of music, lots of play, exploration, and creating together. Now, all of this info and more can be found on our website, meetinghouse.church. Now, before the service begins, I wanted to take a minute uh, to help orient you to worshiping with us online. Check out the description below to find helpful links for you to get the most out of our service today. You'll find PDFs uh, of our handouts, links to learn more about our community, and even more ways to you know, submit prayer requests. If you'd like to get more connected in our community or get connected for the first time, text CONNECTMC to 55498, and one of us on staff will personally follow up with you. Now, as we're getting ready uh, to get started this morning, feel free to send a message in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. And from all of us here at Meeting House Church, welcome. Think about their favorite breakfast food and favorite breakfast joint in the Twin Cities. That'll be great. And welcome to the folks watching online. Thanks for being here. Uh, hopefully you have a morning beverage as well that has caffeine. And here are the questions. What's a group you're a part of? Could be a friend group, could be a club. Maybe you are in a book club. Maybe you go biking with some folks. Maybe you're in a band. Uh, what do you like about it? What do you share in common? And how easy is it for someone else to join or enter that group? But we're glad you're here and we'll get started in a few minutes.
We're good. Oh, great. There. I can even hear myself. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. Um, as we'll get started, I'll invite the band to come up front and, um, and then just to say a hello and good morning. I'm Sarah. I'm one of the members of the community and ministers here on staff. And uh, each Sunday as we gather, we try to animate a theme from the text that we're considering. And today the theme is about the table. <laughs> and tables figure really prominently in many of our lives. We often have family meals around tables or maybe in a car or a picnic table. Uh, tables are gathering spots where, as some of you really feel and know, food can be a transformative space. The table is also a central feature inside of the Christian faith. Every single month, in our church, we gather around the table of communion to remind ourselves of the bread and the life that sustains and nurtures us. The thing about the table, though, is even though that's a center metaphor in our faith, is that tables aren't always safe. Tables aren't always welcoming. In fact, even in the history of our own faith, right, we, there's faith traditions where we practice tables that are only for some. And often we have acted as a church, even as folks who regulate and say, nope, this table's not for you. You're not welcome here. And so people have to take their chairs in the vein of Shirley Chisholm and say, I'm coming to the table anyway. <laughs> what does it mean that at the center of our faith in the new covenant that Jesus opens up is this table? 
So today we want to consider what does it mean that as the good news of Jesus is permeating in the early church and invites us today that this is actually a table, a table that's for everyone, okay? A table that is safe, a table where we're loved and where we're seen. And that's why we thought we would start today with a good old song about the table from the High Women. If you know it, feel free to sing along. If you don't know it yet, I'm, I'm sure you're going to want to become a lover of this song. We invite you to take your worship guide, though. There's a little write-up from Brennan about what this song means to him and some questions for you to consider as we start thinking about being gathered at the table. Before we sing, will you pray with me? God, you know that many of us have experienced tables where we haven't been welcome. Or maybe dinner time in our families was a space, not of safety, but one where we felt like we were walking on eggshells. Or maybe some of us can call to mind the remembrance of being in elementary or middle or even high school, trying to figure out what table would welcome us, what table would turn us away. And maybe some of us have known what it is to also live inside of our skin in the church and not feel welcome at the table. So God, I pray that today you would meet us, that we might find ourselves welcome at the table of life, and that we might be a pe people who are about a welcome table where everyone can belong. It's in your name that we gather. Amen.
Okay, any kids in the back, do you want to come up and join me to sing our God's Garden song? You can bring some of the toys up if you want. <laughs> it's hard to leave them. <laughs> on the count of three. So one, two, three. Hi, church. <laughs> okay, and church on the count of three. Say have fun kids. So one, two, three. Have fun kids. Thank you. Have fun, kids. I think you're watching the next episode of the Unnamed Kids Show. Thank you so much. So enjoy that. Hopefully that wasn't a surprise, Colleen, because I definitely just ruined that surprise. Um, <laughs> we're going to pivot. Uh, in the alternative service, in this service, we uh, like to take a moment, pause, reflect, breathe in, and um, basically consider the theme of the day. So as we think about a uh, crowded table, sharing the table, uh, that made me immediately think about my home uh, decor. So uh, we've been living our house right now for about six years. Um, we like to have family over. We like to have guests over. Uh, and more times than not, there's a comment of like, oh, like we love the cozy feel. We love the decor. Uh, and I think it's worth naming and appreciating and recognizing that it is 100% uh, Marines doing. <laughs> Uh, my partner, my wife, um, she has an aesthetic that's very like global. We have a lot of globes. Uh, there's a <laughs> lot. There's a lot of uh, decor that uh, that she has um, kind of brought into our home, uh, especially from her time in Ecuador. Uh, and we have this one particular uh, painting or picture in our kitchen, uh, and it's this one right here. And it says, share your table. So when I, was, when I heard our theme, this is immediately what I thought of. Uh, and this picture was made by Nikki McClure. Uh, it is called Share Your Table. Um, it is made by just an X-Acto knife. So just different color construction paper and X-Acto knife to get all the details. Uh, I went to Nikki McClure's website just to see if I could learn more about the picture. Uh, and her About Me section just says, I live in Olympia, Washington, where I swim in the Salish Sea and pick berries all summer. So Nikki McClure is a vibe. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate this picture. And I think when we uh, think about tables, we usually think about meals. We usually think about being with the people we care about. Um, like I think about at church. <laughs> What's the go-to move? Uh, will we share a meal? Uh, on Wednesday nights, potlucks come to mind. Um, I know with the students, like obviously like if we can feed them, that's a good move. Like, uh, and I even think about when we do eat together, sometimes those conversations uh, are a little more on the level of heart to hearts versus maybe the structured, uh, hey, how about you turn to your neighbor and talk about this? Sometimes those are great, but I just feel like when you have food in front of you, it kind of benefits the conversation as well. I know it's something we missed during the pandemic, and um, I think even a lot of friends I know who maybe um, church isn't a place that they frequent uh, regularly 
a pattern that's still in their life is trying to get together with friends for meals, the, fam the fr family friend dinner thing, right? Like once a week, every other week. So it is a meaningful activity you participate in. So how I want us to reflect to start off our morning is I want you to take in this picture, maybe for about a couple minutes, uh, and ask yourself, you know, what does it stir up in you? Are there certain memories you can think of? Um, you know, as we look at this picture, there's obviously some folks who uh, maybe are more centered around the, the making of the meal, the preparation, the serving. Maybe some of you get a lot of joy out of hosting. Um, clearly, you see an intergenerational, you know, you see the kids around the table as well. Um, or maybe even it, it's the type of food. Maybe in your family, there's traditions. There's always a dish someone makes. Maybe you've, you've taken that. Uh, that tradition on at some point in your life. So for the next minute and a half, two minutes, just no talking. <laughs> just spend some time in your own thoughts and your own memories. And then after that, we, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to share if you would like. So go ahead. I hear some people already whispering, so why don't we turn to our neighbors and share about some things that stirred up.
If you're lost and you're lonely, go and figure out why. Take a trip to your dark side. Go on and have a good cry. Cause we're all lonely. Yeah, we're all lonely together. I want to see your sadness. I want to share your sins. I want to bleed your blood and I want to be let in. Don't you just, don't we all just want to be together? If your face is down, take a look around. Do your fingers move? Do your lungs inflate? Are you tired? Are you weary of the hidden age you've been holding? Yeah. Did you lose that love or have you never had it? You feeling sad because you did a Thanks so much, y'all. Um, just in case you don't know, I'm gonna just say who's up here, and then you can like say hello to them after. So Megan has been with us, rocking the bass. Some of you may have, may have seen Megan play before when we were um, during the thick of COVID, and you've been back now for a while, so it's great to have you here. Charlie is new with us today, so if you're like, I've never seen Charlie, maybe you haven't actually met Charlie before, because I hadn't. Um, Damon has been around and has been uh, leading and bringing the group together um, this whole year, which has just been wonderful and such a gift, um, and has two of his kids here with us today. And then Al, is this your first time on drums here? Yeah. Making his, his uh, worship debut on drums, we have Alan Church. 
Allen Church, everybody. Uh, Millie has been a part of our community for quite some time and has just more recently been singing a few different times with us, so it's been great to have you. And Brennan came back again. We got connected to Brennan through George, good friends with George uh, uh, of the On Name Kids show fame. And so glad that you're here and leading with us this morning. So thanks so much. And uh, as we continue, will you pray with me? God, this morning, I both echo the words of that song that the places where we are feeling heavy and fearful, or maybe we've been burned at the table before, that today we might risk anew and find ourselves fully welcomed, nourished and fed at this table. And God, also might we be a people who extend profound table welcome to everyone. God, for everyone is fashioned in your image And your invitation to us is to come to the table and to live. It's in Christ's name that we gather. Amen. Well, um, today what I wanted to do is something um, that we maybe haven't necessarily done this before, but I thought we could all together, whether you are online or in person, we could all together read aloud the passage for today that we're considering as we're thinking about the table. Um, This comes from the book of Acts. You will find it on the screen. And uh, I've never read it aloud in this version either. So you're in good company, okay? Ready? Here we go. All of the Jewish believers in Judea heard that the Gentiles were starting to believe. So when Peter visited Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him, saying, Why are you spending time with the Gentiles and eating with them? So Peter shared with them, I was in Joppa and was praying, and I fell into a trance-like vision. Something like a large sheet came down from heaven and was lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. Next slide. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds. I also heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill, and eat. But I replied, no way, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is unclean. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three people came to the house where I was staying, came from Caesarea to the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry about the differences between us. So I went to this man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered how Jesus had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that God gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I should get in the way of God? When they heard this, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem were silenced, and they praised God, saying, 
God has clearly given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. You are taller than I am, Brennan. <laughs> well done, everyone. I hope that went okay with our very short passage for the morning. Um, so part of why I wanted to do this is to, A, you could hear yourself vocalize aloud. Sometimes I, I've said this before. I think we can read texts that maybe, especially if you grew up in the church, can be familiar, but you kind of just gloss over them. Maybe you don't, but... Sometimes you can just read them and you're like, da, 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 da. And don't really stop to pay attention to some of what's going on in it. Okay, so a few notice scenes that I have as I read even this aloud this time. One is, it's the, oh, even the Gentiles, I guess. <laughs> you know, just like these moments where you're like, that's kind of arrogant, <laughs> right? But like, that's part of what's going on here is that there's a conflict in the early church about do even the Gentiles <laughs> I'm guessing that the majority of us gathered this morning would be considered Gentiles, okay? So like, right now, this isn't very revolutionary to be like, even the Gentiles can be Christians. But back then it was, okay? In the earliest church, it was dominantly a Jewish community. And they were wrestling with matters of difference as we've even been talking about during the series on the Church on Mission. In the early church that they're talking about in Acts, they don't really know what to do with all of this difference. They don't know what to do with different cultural practices and norms. Thinking about tables, right? There's different food traditions each of us grew up with, right? Did you ever have an experience where for the first time you smelled food from a, a culture that was very different from yours? I remember the first time I smelled curry. I had never smelled curry before. I was like, what is that? Okay. Well, if you grow up eating curry, it's normal, right? But if you don't grow up eating curry, it's not. And sometimes you grew up thinking that ketchup was a spice. Right? <laughs> These sorts of things are happening in the earliest church where they're wrestling with different table food, different practices and norms and behavior and even as they've had this experience, the early church, right at the beginning in Acts 2, right? The Spirit comes, everyone gets to hear the good news about Jesus in their own tongues, in their own languages, and their own bodies. You'd think that they would be like, oh, we get it. At least I tend to think that about us as humans. It's like you have a profound experience, and then, of course, you live it out that way for the rest of your lives. As it turns out, humans, including myself, are more forgetful as are the folks in the early church. Even though they had this early experience, and what's happened is Peter, amongst others, are going out, they're spending time over table fellowship with Gentiles and people from different cultures. It gets back to the folks in Jerusalem, and they're like, no, you can't do this. There are certain ways that we practice our faith. There are certain ways that you need to show up, and if you don't do that, you're actually, you don't count as a Christian. And so what happens is Peter, along with some of the other Christians, they retract what they, the behavior they had been doing, and they quit eating with Gentiles. Okay. They had originally moved towards table fellowship, and then they back away from it. And right now, they're having a big debate in the church in Jerusalem about if this is okay or not. Uh, some of you, if you've read the book of Galatians in the Bible, this is the center argument that's happening there, is when Paul is coming at Peter for having refused to eat at tables with Gentiles anymore. Okay. So Peter, by now, it takes him, you know, it takes him some time. If you know Peter's story at all, he's like one of those folks who it takes him a little bit of time to kind of catch up to what's going on. But once he does, he's like all in on whatever he's in on. So now he's gotten to the, I'm, I'm back. I'm all in on the table fellowship thing. And so now he's the one who is giving an account to the folks in Jerusalem to tell them about an experience he had which opened him up to see why he actually needed to eat with Gentiles and to show up at places where there was difference. It took him a very serious dream to realize this, but he got there. So good for Peter, right? This conflict has been one that has continued throughout the lineage of the church. Many missionaries, as we've gone to different uh, parts of the world from the West, 
brought with them their own culture because all of us are from cultures. All of us have the ways that we were raised that have formed and shaped us. But would often go to these places and say, unless you behave like this, unless you act like this, unless you eat this food, you're not Christian. And I sometimes want to ask them, have you read Acts? Or like, have you, have you, have you read the Bible? Because I'm pretty sure that one of the central tenets of the early church is actually that God shows up and the Spirit shows up in diversity. God shows up in the midst of all of our cultures, in the midst of all of the different tables, and that there is beauty in it. And yet the human proclivity and propensity is to not necessarily know what to do with this difference. And so it often takes us some time and the work of the Spirit in order for us to be opened up. It's a very normal human thing. But to be opened up, to sit at tables and have it be a welcome, safe space for everyone, that's actually a faith thing. That's a central message within the Christian good news, is that we've known tables where we're not welcome, but we are invited and asked and called to be a people where welcome defines who we are. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, particularly about Acts. It's how sometimes I think Christians can read the Bible and we make it such an abstract text. We can say, I take the Bible real seriously. You know, I take it real seriously. And then you start reading through the Bible. Just start in Acts, for instance, you know? Again, I've said this, the early church, it says, they sold all their possessions and held things in common. I take the Bible real seriously, folks. You don't take the Bible seriously. And then I want to be like, so do you own your own house? Or at least partially own it and the bank owns the rest? You know? Well, because I mean, if we're taking the Bible seriously, I mean, shouldn't we all sell everything and like live in common? Or something? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I just read it in the Bible. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on, right? But this is another one of those moments where we approach this text where Peter has a dream and there's an argument around difference. <laughs> and people are like, yeah, yeah, that's a really good story. I take the Bible seriously. And then you're like, okay, so everyone's welcome at our table, right? Well, no, I mean, but God's real clear. Not, and not everyone's welcome at the table. I mean, you know, if you're a sinner, you're not welcome at the table. You're like, but, but I think, I, but the, those people aren't welcome at the table. But I, 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 I think the Bible says something about the table and like maybe Peter and there was like a dream and it might have something to do with today. I don't know. Is anyone like resonating with this at all? Like, kind of like, let's just like, let's take the Bible seriously. Okay, let's take the Bible seriously. Okay. I grew up in a tradition, as you've heard, where we were the only ones who took the Bible seriously. If you didn't grow up in my tradition, even if you were like Methodist or Lutheran or something, you didn't take the Bible seriously. We only took the Bible seriously. I didn't think people at this church took the Bible seriously when I grew up. Okay, it's actually true. Okay. Now, what did that actually mean? It meant basically that you thought whatever my people thought about what everything that we thought that the Bible said that we already thought. So like, for instance, who was welcome at the table? Well, we had clear rules about who that was. And we took the Bible seriously. And if you had any different thoughts about that, well, you weren't taking the Bible seriously. Now, never mind if you were to point me out to this passage, I wouldn't necessarily know what to do with it, right? But I think a lot of what's happened in the world and in the church is that a lot of folks like me who grew up in the church being told, here is the only way to live. The table isn't for everybody. And then some of us actually read the Bible and thought, maybe the table is for everybody. Or like maybe Jesus should get taken seriously when, when Jesus says that, like it says about Jesus that Jesus was sent because God loves everyone. Like maybe if I'll take that seriously. And then suddenly you were shown the door because you took that seriously. Let me try to say this again. What I'm trying to say is some of us grew up in the church being told, here's what it means to take the Bible seriously. We took the actual Bible seriously, discovered that in it, there's all these passages about how God cares for the poor, the widow, the orphan, how God cares about the table being for everyone, how God cares about difference, how God is love, all these sorts of things. And suddenly you show up and you say, hey, in the Bible, it says that God cares about women. I won the argument. And they're like, there's the door. 
And you're like, but I, I, it's, okay. Maybe none of you have had this experience. I've had this experience. <laughs> and I tell you what, a lot of my friends have had this experience. None of my friends who grew up taking the Bible seriously go to church. Because we took the Bible seriously. And we got encountered by this God in Jesus who said the tables for everybody. We became a people who, knowing ourselves loved by God, wanted to be that kind of people in the world. And when we started talking about things like, I think God loves everyone of every sexuality, there's the door. I think God thinks that like men and women uh, should have equality in the world, there's the door. I think we should talk about hard stuff in our past. There's the door. Part of why I'm here and why I'm a pastor is because I actually believe in this gospel. I believe God is love. I want to take the Bible seriously. And I refuse to believe that just because someone told me that they're the only one who, who's taken the Bible seriously, that that's the only perspective that counts. Okay. Back when there was the wrestling in our state around the marriage amendment for marriage equality, I was going to a community, I'd started going to a community in which every single sermon was supportive of marriage equality. Now, there are churches at the same time that, that were arguing that the Bible is completely against marriage equality for everyone, okay? And this church was totally pro that. And I was like, that's great, that's fine. That's, um, but they never dealt with the Bible, okay? Because for so many people, the Bible has been used to be exclusionary. So they didn't know what to do with the text. And part of the work we're trying to do here in this community is to say we want to be people who take the Bible seriously, but who take our lives seriously, who take seriously having tables where everyone is welcome, including ourselves. We want to be a people who, as we wrestle and risk and welcome beloved and all of the values we say that we profess, we want to live them, or at least try, right? German theologian and ethicist who lived after World War II, Dorothy Zola, she talked about approaching the Bible with a hermeneutics of hunger. A hermeneutics of hunger. And what it means is to approach the Bible with the cares and concerns from our actual lives and from our world and to wrestle with how the Bible speaks into that space. Where does it animate and invite us into more life? I want us to be a people who likewise wrestle with and engage with the texts and the story of our faith, that we don't need to eschew the Bible just because sometimes it's been used to beat us up or to beat other people up. But we reapproach the Bible and come across passages like this and take it seriously. Not in a, I have all the right answers, but in a way that says, what's going on here? Oh my gosh, read the book of Acts. It's revolutionary. They're getting thrown in jail for being like against the law. That's civil unrest. They're doing things that extend fellowship to everyone. That's about diversity. I mean, translate it into the modern time. What does the Bible speak and is it good news in our time? Don't let it just be abstract. How does it connect with our real lives? Because this text doesn't just belong to people who say the table isn't for everyone. The God who is in this text is a God who is for everyone and whose table fellowship invites all of us in our own skins to get to come. Christianity is supposed to be about good news and about life, not about power, not about exclusion, not about harm. And I think most of you who I know, some of you I might not know yet, if you bother at all with still being Christian, or you might have a tenuous relationship with that, or you might be totally into it, it's because there's something for you about this God of life. There's something about faith 
that you say, I've known myself as loved and I want to live that. You've said, I want to see this kingdom that's not about power or might come into being. I want to show up where God shows up with the poor and the oppressed. I believe in that world. I believe in that world too. And I'm more convinced today than I was before when I thought I was taking the Bible seriously and had to have all the right answers. I'm more convinced of the beauty of this good news than I used to be because it's actually good news to me now that as I found and truly discovered and been getting to live a life in which I get to be at the table, I get to throw open the doors and say, this table's for everybody. Bring your food. I got some stuff to learn. And let's eat together and discover the beauty of the table where God says this is the new covenant. It's a covenant in which everyone is welcome at this table. A covenant of life. This morning I told some folks that on my way into church, if I was going to tweet, which I didn't because I was driving, I would have tweeted and said, I went to bed at 1 a.m. last night as I was finishing my dissertation, which is going to happen. <laughs> uh, and I woke up this morning, I got to feed my human, and I got out of the shower and Andy was dancing with said little human Josie to Lizzo. <laughs> and I got to come here and to be able to preach and be in this community where in my own skin, I get to know I'm loved and I get to show up that way. Man, that's good news to me. So might the good news be ours and yours as well. That this table is a table where none of us are unclean. It's a table for all of us. And then let's be a people who extend that table fellowship and welcome one to another. Because the God who we love is the God of love and the God of all of us. Will you pray with me? God, where this table and the church has caused harm, I just want to name that grief to say I'm sorry. God, might the table that you have set for all of us be a table of welcome, a table where we know ourselves as loved, a table where we're warmed from the inside out. Grant us courage that we might show up at that table and find ourselves seen and healed and cared for, and give us courage as well to lean in when the smells are are new to us, when the tastes are different, when the customs and ways of being aren't familiar, that we might discover the joy and the good news indeed, that in each of our bodies and in each of our skins, the church is made manifest in the beauty of a table that is crowded with the beautiful diversity of all of your children. So by the power of your spirit, and your work of love embodied in Christ. Give us faith and change and transform us. In your name, amen. Ask you now to turn to um, a neighbor at your table and just share a little bit about the table and how thinking about it uh, continues to open you up as to how to hold space for there to be difference. And then we'll sing our last song here in just a minute. I'll invite the band to come on up too.
I don't know if this is tall enough. Come here for 
forgiveness Have you come to raise the dead Have you come here to play Jesus To the lepers in your Thanks, man. Announcement time. What's happening? What happened? All right, so uh, if you were here on Wednesday night, there was some energy in this room. Uh, it was really vibrant. I don't know if you were like me. I like was driving uh, into church, and when I rounded the corner, I was like, where are all these cars from? Like, what's happening? Am I missing something? Um, it helps when you have a 17-piece swing band. So that's 17 different cars, but it was also really full. Um, we had our swinging this summer event, super uh, exciting, a wonderful time. Uh, we had a dance floor, uh, moves, dance moves were shown, not to call anyone out, but Steve back there, uh, Eric Hansen, Carrie, some of our middle schoolers were spinning on their heads. <laughs> it was really great. Uh, we had burgers. Uh, we didn't have burgers, and we had more burgers, <laughs> root beer floats, uh, nine square in the air, in the courtyard. We had all of our uh, service projects in the hallway with our mission partners. So uh, I definitely want to do a shout out. Um, Pat Peterson, a lot uh, with the coordinating, Nicole Smalley, Elaine Helney, um, Michelle Stanky. Am I missing anyone else? A lot of people helped, but definitely want to name those folks. So uh, thanks if you could join with that. Um, if you had a good taste in your mouth from that event and you're like, man, I want to hang out with my church more, we're still doing stuff. <laughs> so uh, we're swinging in the summer, so we are here in the summer, so just stay connected. You could check out our website, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Make sure you sign up for the E! News. Uh, for um, Sunday morning worship services uh, as we enter into the summer, um, we're going to have a similar rhythm, like the be many Sundays where we have both services, but there will be some uh, Sundays where uh, we have a joint service. So the next two Sundays, that is the case. Uh, for Memorial Day, we'll be in the meeting house uh, for one service. And then the Sunday after that, we're having our senior baccalaureate service uh, in the Great Hall. So we'll be celebrating some of our seniors, seeing them off uh, to their next adventure. Um, so hope you can make that. Uh, on your tables, you may have noticed some yellow cards. Uh, a lot of what makes our Sunday mornings welcoming, inviting, um, are our volunteers, whether it's our ushers, our greeters, what have you. Uh, and we're hoping to give them a little break this summer. So we're looking for uh, just some folks to help out with that greeting. How do we welcome people as they join our crowded table, our metaphor metaphorical table of uh, 
just our church, our faith community. So um, it is not a scary commitment. <laughs> You're not signing away anything. You can honestly help for just one week, but just connect with Michelle uh, and we can plug and play. And obviously the more hands on deck, uh, the better. Right now, I want to invite up Michelle Moser, who uh, is on our generosity uh, committee uh, as she talks about generosity. Hopefully that's a good setup. (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Good morning. I'm Michelle Moser. I'm on Generosity Ministry Action Team. And we gather stories of generosity and have been for a little over the last year. I've got a letter to share with you guys. It's from a member of our church, and they've chosen to remain anonymous. So this is a letter from Anonymous. Uh, My thoughts on generosity from Anonymous. I'm not the richest person in the world, but I don't need to compare myself to anyone else to know how rich I really am because I've been abundantly blessed by God. To live in this country, to live in this state, to live in this time in history, to be healthy, to have a good job, and I know I want to give back because of this abundant blessing. I know that being generous to others and to the church makes a big difference. I'm an aspiring tither, that's in quotes, aiming for the 10% giving goal. I'm not there yet, but I am getting close. Last year, I doubled my monthly offering, and I wasn't sure I would be able to sustain it, but it's worked out great so far. I have to admit, it is a bit scary calculating the dollar amounts to get to what 10% means. There go my first fruits, I say. But I do feel joyful giving this money away. It's God's money, really, not mine at all. It feels like such an honor to be able to give a portion of my income to this church each month. I think it's true that every penny counts, and when those pennies get combined, amazing things happen. I like that my gift gets pooled with everybody else's, and this collective offering magnifies God's work. I like that my gift pays a portion of the staff's salary and helps them support their families. I like that my gift keeps the lights on so that others can come into this fine building. I like that my gift helps the choir make great music and the band. I added that one. I like that my gift provides snacks and activities and camps for the kids so that they have a safe place to learn about God. And these kids are inviting their friends and neighbors to join them. I like that my gift helps with missional work so that people outside of our walls can experience God's love. I appreciate how this church does weddings and funerals and holidays and prayer. I appreciate how this church chose to get messy with changing our name and asking the tough questions and being okay with differing opinions and so much more. Thank you for reading my letter, and I just want to close with saying I'm all in Meeting House Church. Sincerely, Anonymous. If anyone has a story, they would like to share their own story anonymously or owning it, too. Um, GMAT is welcoming any and all forms of comments on generosity. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, and thank you, Anonymous. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, sometimes giving can be something that's a little abstract, and talking about money can sometimes make people uncomfortable. But yeah, just hearing all the things that we do as a church, really, that's what it goes towards. So if you're a tither, if you're, I'm trying to remember the term, aspiring tither, uh, there's a lot of ways to give online, uh, texting, cash and check. I think there's a box in the back. And as always, like generosity is just your whole self. So just like we're talking about volunteering this summer with services or... um, extending our, uh, a spot at our crowded table, um, we encourage you to give and be a part of the life of this church. So as we enter into this week and into the summer, uh, my hope for everyone here is you have many moments around crowded tables with friends and family and loved ones, uh, and maybe leave a seat, seat empty for someone who might join you. All right. Thanks, everybody.